as they get the track ready for tomorrow's races. A beautiful day in the books here at Belmont Park. Welcome to Insider here on MSG+. Plus. I'm Richard Migliori, joined by the lovely Maggie Wolfenell. Maggie, a great day of racing. Yeah, it, re it was, Richie. Also, great weather. We've really lucked out um, this past week with some nice weather, low humidity these past couple days. And we had some great turf racing uh, as well. Yeah, it, the turf racing is always exciting. Usually, it's about trips. That's why we have trips and traps, right? But Yeah, uh, you and Andy Sterling <laughs> always uh, informing the public of what they should be aware of and, and maybe play next time. Well, sometimes the public makes us aware of races to look at as well. They do. But we got to talk about some headlines, some not great news. Um, Rajiv Maraj injured a little worse than uh, originally we were told, we were informed about. He has fractures of T4, 5, 6, and 7, uh, a broken rib and a slightly punctured lung. The good news is no surgery, but we're looking at a pretty long convalescence. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks as though he's going to be out for Saratoga. I feel so bad for Raj. He's had a succession of injuries, and he, poor guy, he, he's, you know, he comes back, he rides well every time he comes back, too. So hopefully this will be the same sort of case and a speedy recovery to Raj. Yeah, I mean, I kind of felt the same way that he had really hit his stride the last month. And when you start having injuries pile up where you don't have a lot of time between them, it's hard to rebuild your business. So I hope the horsemen don't forget, Raj, because he was riding terrific. Yeah, exactly. And and I think, you know, people get more leery than, you know, the guy himself. Did you find that when you were riding? Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I started having more injuries close together. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate my first severe injuries, I had a lot of time between them, but when they started piling up in quick succession, I found it harder and harder. And, uh, you know, Raj is a bit younger, though, than I was at that stage, and uh, he was riding terrific, and all our best thoughts and prayers for Raj for a speedy recovery. Ruben Silvera, um, the rider that was disqualified out of that um, spill, was handed a 10-day suspension. He hasn't informed the stewards as of yet whether he's going to appeal. If he doesn't appeal, it'll be reduced to seven. Yeah, it, it, you know, sometimes the, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. I hate to put it that way, but, yeah. you know, it, there's Raj going to be out for a long time, and he only has that certain amount of days. I, I agree. I don't think you can be severe enough in, in, in those situations. Another rider involved in an incident yesterday was Irad Ortiz in the last race. He fortunately was okay. He was not injured. He was sore. But he decided to drop his uh, appeal of a five-day suspension that he incurred earlier in the meet. Yeah, and he's going to ride that out. He'll be back next Saturday, I believe. Actually, Actually Friday. They Friday. allowed him he, oh. to take tomorrow as a suspension day, wow. which was a bit surprising to me. I had never, when I was riding, I had never um, seen stewards allow that because he was already named on horses. I've never really seen it either. <laughs> yeah, well, you learn something new every day <laughs> exactly. in this game. But he should be back next Friday, and probably a couple of days off will do him well and freshen him up for Saratoga. Yeah, he'll be ready, and it'll be interesting to see, though, with him gone, will that jockey standing even out a little bit as Javier Castellano is still riding here? Yeah, Javier certainly tightened it up today. We'll get to that, but let's get to some out-of-town racing and head over to Monmouth Park, the Long Branch Stakes, a prep for the Haskell. Maybe some of these will be taking on American Faro in about a month. a solid move for the lead at the top of the stretch. Super Colossal cannot keep him at bay. Stanford putting it all together now. Opens up to lead by two and a half. Super Colossal, he's not done. Switching to the outside, coming back for more. And total joint. Stanford, Super Colossal, valiant, trying hard. Stanford has a little too much for him, though. And Stanford wins the long branch. Super Colossal second, total joint third. A long way back to battle midway fourth. That was Frank Miramati with the call of the Long Branch. And uh, it looked like Stanford was going to win off by four or five lengths. I think he got to pull it up. What was your thought on it? I have never been that convinced of how far this horse actually wants to go. Okay. I thought he's, he's run almost beyond his means sometimes and that he's a little bit of an overachiever, maybe overshadowed as well for some of the other more, you know, talented Pletcher horses, but he's kind of been steadily plugging his way. It was nice to see him finally get a win here um, as he was second in here at Belmont on Belmont Stakes Day in the Easy Goer. He's going, and that was Jersey Joe Bravo aboard. Down at Delaware Park, they had the Delaware Oaks. Lovely Maria, a huge favorite. Let's listen in as John Curran takes us to the stretch. 
is still Calamity K trying to hold on. Up on the outside, Bar of Gold's making a nice move. White Clover, Lovely Maria's gotten the worst of it today. She's four wide turning for home, has her work cut out, but Calamity K cuts the corner, opens up three on the field. Calamity K by two and a half with Bar of Gold. Lovely Maria's in trouble as Peace and Wars roaring on the outside. Calamity K looking to steal this one, and she's looking good. Peace and Wars rallying well, but Calamity K steals the Delaware Oaks. She wins it virtually wire to wire. Peace and Wars second, followed by Hip Hop and Jazz third. Lovely Maria faded down the lane. Hall of Famer Edgar Prado gets it done on the 50 to 1 Calamity Kate. And stealing it gate to wire, as you were just telling me about back in the early 90s, you did the same thing for that Delaware Oaks. If you can get away with some easy fractions in that first kind of half a mile, you can probably make it uh, scot free. <laughs> wire to wire victory. Lovely Maria really had no run, was wide every step of the way, but never looked like she was traveling like a 1 to 9 shot should. So hopefully they'll regroup, and maybe we'll get to see her in the Alabama. And yeah, Boo Boo Clark kind of niggling at her the whole way. She just never felt comfortable, as she was stacked about three or four wide throughout. Some good out-of-town races, but we had a great one-mile turf race today. Let's head to race nine, the Forbidden Apple. Larry Colmas with the call. They're off in the Forbidden Apple, and King Creesa broke the best, and Wicked Strong broke last. King Creesa will go to the early lead. How great on the outside, away running in second. And there he goes, and How Great's going to take over quickly from King Creesa up the back stretch. So it's going to be How Great to take the lead. And well off the rail, King Creesa, two lengths behind in second, reload is third, Grand Arch is fourth, and then Vine Jacket, Wicked Strong. And they're six lengths behind How Great and Cornelio Velasquez, who went 23 and two for the first quarter mile. And they're going to open up here to a three length lead. And King Creesa will let him do it. King Crease and Jose Ortiz content to sit second here and reload is three quarters of a length off of him. And then it's Grand Arch on the outside, Vijack and Wicked Strong. How great on a front-running mission into the far turn. And he's got a four-length lead here. Went 45 and three for a half mile. It is how great by two and a half. King Creesa whittling away at the lead in second and reload is moving with him. And on the far outside, a four wide Grand Arch. Wicked Strong has saved every inch of ground and now Swinch is outside of a tiring. How great as they come to the top of the stretch in the Forbidden Apple. And here's Reload. And Reload runs up alongside of King Creesa as they come into the final furlong. Three quarters in 108 and four. And King Creesa is not done yet. King Creesa has taken the lead from Reload. It is King Creesa in front, and he's pulling away. Reload, getting weary late. Wicked Strong's going to be second as King Creesa wins. Wicked Strong was second. Vijack is third. Then a photo between Reload. This was an absolutely courageous performance. Last time, King Creesa got everything his own way. This time, he allowed How Great to set fast fractions, came out, and he shook off that big challenge from Reload. He's so, so game, and it was funny. This was not the plan I was saying to Dave Donk. I said, man, before the race, you got so lucky with the two speed scratches. This should be a walk in the park for you. Turned out it wasn't, as Cornelia Velasquez did have a little bit of trouble with How Great. Looks as though he was getting the better of his hold, so, uh, but things working out just fine for King Creesa. Well, terrific performance by him, and you talked to Dave Donk before the race. Well, you caught up with Jose Ortiz and Dave Donk after the race in the winner's circle. Here with the winning connections of today's Forbidden Apple, King Creesa, and we're going to turn our attention to winning jockey Jose Ortiz. You took him all the way on the poker. That didn't quite work out today. I think you were thinking that it was going to since the speed scratch really came out with your turf goggles on, but plan B, it seemed to work out, though. How was your trip? The uh, trip was great, you know, King Chris, I always break good. I tried to send her to the lead, but then I saw the seven hole, he came outside and, you know, he took the lead. I saw the rider, he was a little getting in trouble with him, so I let him go I, and I gave my horse a chance, you know. He really deserved it, he's a nice horse. And when I got it, when I asked him to go, he responded very well, so... I think you two have a nice report together, two for two now uh, with King Creesa. Yeah, you know, I'm going to thank the trainer for giving me the opportunity and the owners. And David has been doing a tremendous job with this horse, so congratulate him. That he has. Good job, Jose. Talk to the man of the hour. I mean, the first two races, we were a little concerned. Maybe he wasn't the King Creesa of yesterday, but you have him on his game right now, Dave. Yeah, geez, I was impressed today um, as a fan. So, um, you know, obviously it worked out well. He rated nice behind the horse that wanted to go to the lead. So he's done it before, but we know that his best race is probably on the lead. And uh, But I, I was impressed the way he kicked on through the stretch. 
I was too. I think everybody was. Pretty nice final time as well. Now, is a four-star Dave a likely next start? Or are we going back to New York Bread Company? Well, you know, we kind of toyed with the idea, and I think most everybody that was in here was thinking about that race, so why not? And he's run very well in Saratoga. He was one of his best races, second to Wise Dan, and I was impressed with his race off the layoff at Saratoga last year, so he obviously has run well over the course. So um, I think if everything's okay, and uh, I think that's probably be on the top of our list. Well, Dave, the future once again is looking bright for King Creaser. Congratulations. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Maggie, I think King Creaser earned his way to give the uh, open horses a try up in Saratoga in the Four Star Dave, and he went over a million dollars in earnings today. Congratulations to him and his owners, Breeders, and Dave Donk. And he's beaten open company the last two times. Why shouldn't he take on uh, them again in the Four Star Dave? He is just in stride, you know, just striking while the iron's hot as of now with King Creaser. He's in good form. Well, we got to take our first time out. We'll be right back with more Insider after this. Don't forget, Saratoga Racecourse right around the corner. Only six days of racing left here at Belmont Park. And you can reserve your table today even in the backyard picnic area and the all-new Carousel Sports Bar. You can go online, Ticketmaster.com, or call 844-NYRA-TIX. And... Uh, Maggie, a lot of good racing here today. I, mean, I know we're getting excited. We're going to jump the gun and get to Saratoga, but we've got to get to race eight, a nice allowance race going a mile and eight on the turf. And there's Larry Colmus with your call. They're off. Kensington Court hesitated just a bit coming out of there. Made in Detroit goes out to the front, indebted on the inside with some early speed, too. These two out to the front together, and Tiztown is away running in third and going with them three wide into the turn. Johnson City Kid taken in hand to sit on the hedge in fourth and five lengths off the lead, right alongside of Persuasive and Net Gain three wide. The trailer is slow starting Kensington Court as they make their way to the back stretch in 25 seconds flat. Made in Detroit, the leader, Tiztown, three quarters of a length behind on the outside, second by two. Indebted will be third up the back stretch. And then comes net gain on the outside. Between horses persuasive, Johnson City Kid down toward the inside, and Kensington Court is right behind them. Six and a half lengths separates the entire field as they continue up the back stretch in a 50 and two half mile for Made in Detroit and Luis Saez, and they're almost a length in front of Tiz Town now. Then it's indebted third to the inside, net gain fourth, Johnson City Kid fifth, followed by Persuasive and Kensington Court, now five off the lead. Made in Detroit into the far turn in front. Tiztown just a little bit closer now, a half length behind as they round the far turn. And then comes indebted, and now Made in Detroit kicks away a length and a half. Tiztown starts to drop back a bit, indebted on the inside is next by two and a half. Johnson City Kid comes off the rail outside of net gain. They're into the stretch. Made in Detroit coming into the final furlong with a two-length lead. Indebted switch to the outside. And then comes Tiztown, who's trying to get back into the race on the far outside. And then it's net gain and Johnson City Kid. And here comes indebted. And indebted gets there in time over Made in Detroit. Then it was Ned Kane and Tiztown. Well, Maggie, Joel Rosario doesn't know anybody anything with this flawless ride on Indebted. I thought so, too. I mean, really, Maiden Detroit had everything his own way, and I thought a very good ride by Luis Saez as well, kind of not walking the dog, but controlling the pace, setting moderate fractions, being aggressive at uh, the break, and, you know, Joel, he's so strong. He can pick up a horse and move them towards the lead, and that's exactly what he did with Indebted and the same colors and connections as tonalist in the winner's circle. Yeah, Christoph Comont continuing his fine meet, and Joel Rosario looked like when he switched to the outside, and Dedded found another gear. Yes, he did. Let's head on to race one. Nice field of New York-bred maidens, two-year-olds, going five and a half. They're off. 
No Entiendo is going to the front. Uno Amayo away running in second. Checking out of there was Cold as Ice who got caught in some early traffic. And there goes the Under Sheriff. And the Under Sheriff goes up to challenge for the lead as the field races for the turn. Then Chinchilla Dust in fourth position. Fake it till you make it. Is fifth right now just to the outside of Samity Sky who comes on through and now switches to the outside and begins to move up three wide. Then the funny thing, the JY and Cold as Ice now relegated to the back after a 23 and 2 opening quarter mile. No Oh, Entiendo is the leader. The under sheriff on the outside second, and Samity Sky is coming up to them with a three wide move as they come toward the top of the stretch. Uno Amayo cuts the corner, and a funny thing gets going from fifth. They're into the stretch, and it is No Entiendo trying to hold on to the lead. On the outside, the under sheriff runs on in second. Behind them is Uno Amayo down on the inside. The funny thing is there too with Samity Sky to the outside, and Chinchilla Dust far outside. No Entiendo in front. Uno Amayo coming up the fence. These two down to the wire. Here comes Uno Amayo. Uno Amayo got there over No Entiendo. And then it was the under sheriff and a funny thing. Uno Amayo pretty professional in the second start rallying up the fence under Javier Castellano, our right, Rad Ortiz off his mounts, but maybe some green horses in behind him. Yeah, it looked like at the eight, just kind of getting tired on the front end, wavering through the stretch, staying on that left lead, interfered with the funny thing who was rallying from behind. We'll check that out right now. It's just kind of a chain reaction kind of thing. And you did see Junior Alvarado kind of steady there um, off of heels with the funny thing. Yeah, and you can see they shift around, and these young horses are getting tired. Kind of bears out under a left-handed whip and forces that horse out further. Sorry, that was Manny Franco I was talking yeah, about on the Franco. funny thing. But you're right. I, they're babies. They're green. Uh, but I do have to give a mention. Obviously, Rudy finishing 1-2 there. And uh, a the funny bone getting his first winner as a freshman sire. Actually, I thought you tweeted something that was pretty you know, sharp earlier on. It's either Todd Pletcher or Rudy Rodriguez winning these two-year-old races. It really is. It kind of seems like Rudy's winning the second tier kind of two-year-old races, the, the you know, maybe the, the New York Reds more so. Um, but both of them just firing them out, uh, having them ready. It just seems like they're further along than their competition, and you notice that, at least from my perspective, in the paddock, too. Yeah, when a horse is professional, it makes the jockey's life a lot easier. We got to get to our sensational seven races two, three, four, five, six, seven, and ten. Flamingo Lane still the leader. Alongside his Giants Jewel, Fall Into Faith, now being passed by Tap It Out, and Tango Time takes the inside run and is up into fourth now. They're into the stretch, and it's Giants Jewel on the outside at the rail. Flamingo Lane battles on Flamingo Lane's in front. Flamingo Lane keeps that lead with one furlong to go. Giants Jewel starting to get leg weary. Tap It Out's there on the outside. Tango Time is at the rail, and Silverville is closing late in the center of the course. It's Flamingo Lane to hold on and win. Silverville got second from Tap It Out and Tango, but well behind the top two at this point. A half mile in 45 and two, and they're into the stretch, and Proven Commodities got the lead, drifting out to the middle of the racetrack, but well clear. Proven Commodity by four, by five now. And then it is War Ride. Vinegar Joe late on the scene on the outside. Bowtie Boss back to fourth. Proven Commodity. Under the line, a four-length winner, over Vinegar Joe. Then it was War Ride and Bowtie Bond. After them, as they come to the top of the stretch, Dark Rose still there. Banana Thief on the outside. Disco Partners getting going quickly now. And here comes Disco Partner in the center of the course with Dark Roast to catch. Dark Roast in front in the final 16th from Disco Partner and Banana Thief is third. Disco Partner getting to Dark Roast late. And it's going to be Disco Partner to score over Dark Roast. And then it was Banana Thief and Bajan Summer. Ching Skies on the inside in front. Alongside Trail Walker, these two right together on the lead. Colonel Juanita next. Darling Bridezilla coming up after them on the far outside. In behind the leaders, Wisdom of Oz is next. And farthest out is Coast of Sangria into the final furlong. For Colonel Juanita, Darling Bridezilla, these two one two now. And here's Darling Bridezilla forging to the front. Manny Franco and Darling Bridezilla to be Colonel 
Juanita. And then it was Trail Walker and Coast of San Top of the stretch. And Edaway turns for home in front. Jim two on the outside. Dr. Keo third and closing in. And then it's Hush Hush Mush Mush. Fourth in behind the leaders. And from far behind, Tom's Vision is kicking it in two on the extreme outside. Final furlong. And Jim two has taken over the lead. Hush Hush Mush Mush is there. Freudian lights on the inside. Tom's Vision on the far outside. It's going to be Jim two. And then it was Hush Hush Mush Mush, followed by Freudian Light at the top of the stretch. And it's Howell who turns for home in front. Howell off the turn with a three-length lead. African Fighter has moved up into second on the far outside, still with Howell to catch. And one furlong to do it. Howell and Junior Alvarado a two-and-a-half-length lead. On the outside, African fighter and Luis Saez running out of time. It's Howell holding on. On the outside, African fighter, Howell. An African fighter on the wire. And then came 30%. Joe Gray turns for home with a two-length lead. Into the final furlong, Williams Lucky Gray keeps on going. Blooper to the inside, trying to make a race of it in second. And then it's Willow U in third. Williams Lucky Gray has got it close to home. Blooper on the outside, tries to make a final bid, but won't get Williams Lucky Gray. Blooper, second best under the line. Third is a photo between Willow U and... Maggie, you couldn't have said it any better at the beginning of the show. A lot of great turf racing. But the race that we want to take a closer look at was a dirt race. I thought a really good field of maidens in race three. I thought so, too. You know, the ones that have run before, looking at their past PPs and the horses that they had run with, obviously Bowtie Boss, he was the horse to beat. That's who everybody, you know, was attracted to. But the horse is four starts, four seconds. This one that we're seeing win here, Proven Commodity, he finished, I mean, granted, well behind Requite, who honestly was my favorite two-year-old up there last year. And Louis Saez, a heads-up ride from the rail, go. And this horse returning for Tommy Albatrani. I thought, you know, looking at him in the paddock, he might need a race, but there was talent there. He just looked like an athlete, but he didn't need a race, that's for sure. Came back with a pretty nice win. And Tommy Albatrani's barn heating up, probably at the right time as we head towards Saratoga. Let's get to the standings, jockey standings. Well, I know there's no change on the top of the leaderboard, but uh, Javier Castellano cut one more uh, win off the lead of Irad Ortiz, who now has to sit out for a few days. Right, only five behind Irad right now as we have a day and a full week left of the Belmont Spring summer meeting. Jose Ortiz, our star of the day with that forbidden apple win, and uh, he's having a fine meet in his own right as well. Todd Pletcher stuck on that 40 spot, not a bad number, but we were looking for him maybe potentially to break the uh, win's record for this meet. I he only has one win this week, I do believe. It seems like we've been saying 40, 40, 40 for the past yeah. couple days here. I'm sure he'll get another one at least. It'll be interesting to see, though, if he'll get to 44 or 45. And no change up on the top of the owner standings heading into the final week. One more day in the final week. Michael Dubb, David Jacobson still tied on top. Godolphin actually one win closer to them after that win in the third with proven commodity. We had some claims today. Uh, matching skies for 12-5 to uh, Greg DePrima. Hal, a good winner, Charlton Baker stepped in for. I think we have to pay attention to Hal now. He's found that form. He looked really good today physically. And Charlie Baker, when he goes in for one also for himself, I think you have to pay attention next time they're in the entries. Charlton Baker, man, putting his money where his mouth is. We got time for one more timeout. Beautiful Belmont Park in the background. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Insiders. We jump right into our preview for tomorrow's races. Maggie, here's top billing, narrowly defeated at Keeneland. And boy, he is a deep closer, Richie. He was not even on the screen before they hit the quarter pole here. Uh, whether the one turn suits him or maybe he's like a horse who appreciates these wide sweeping turns here, turns at Belmont, it'll be interesting to see what he does coming to Belmont or racing at Belmont for the first time. Well, he's going to need pace in front of him. One of the horses that may be a pace player here is anchor down as we're looking at him run second last time at Belmont. 
to Matru, who's kind of a common horse through both of these horses, PPs. He was a return winner uh, last time here at Belmont, impressively as well. But Top Billing actually did finish ahead of him in that Keeneland race. So uh, whether Top Billing is better than Matru or better than Anchor Down, too, um, I think that's a kind of interesting theme throughout that third race. I think pace is going to be the main factor mm -hmm. in how that pace plays out in that race. Another race that could have pace um, ramifications is the ninth race, the Manila, and we saw a really nice horse from Bill Mott last time a lot with Johnny Velasquez. He was impressive here in the Paradise Creek. But Richie does a lot get the lead tomorrow going a mile. I think it's interesting because um, there's other pace in here and when this horse has been kind of headed on the lead or hasn't found himself in a more cushy kind of spot, he tends to fold trying to get that extra furlong. And he does have horses with speed inside of him and outside of him. High noon rider, though, as we're looking at him win, uh, actually run second at Gulfstream, is another closer. Yes, he is. A race could set up for him here if that pace does collapse. He's been flattered by Force the Pass, who beat him uh, going back to that Gulfstream race that we're watching here. And Force the Pass beat him once again, only a length and a quarter, though, in that pen mile. Well, another pace player here, Nana's boy, first time on the turf. And I think from the rail, he's going to have to show some of the speed. He is a distorted humor. Uh, there, it's, That's an OK turf influence. There's no pedigree on the bottom side of the immediate family to try the turf. So we're kind of really dealing with an unknown here. As you said, his speed will be his weapon. Absolutely. So pace is going to be the main thing that goes on in race nine. And if a lot could get comfortable, I think he's the most talented. Mm -hmm. But talking about talent, let's throw it to Andy Serling and see what he likes for tomorrow with our handicapper, Insider. Thanks a lot. Well, we've got a 10 race card on Sunday. And this will be my last insider pick before we head up to Saratoga. And I'm going to take a look at a horse in the sixth race. And it feels like some trips and traps horses have been having success recently. And I'm going to talk about another horse that Richie and I talked about at trips and traps recently. And that is the three, Sanctifica. I think I'm getting her name right. And this is the second time star for trainer Christophe Clement. First time out, she ran a race that featured an absolutely supersonic pace, a pace that completely and totally melted down and helped very much horses making deep closes. Sanctifica ran amazingly well for that start. She was 43 to 1, and she buried the two other speeds. And one of them was a heavily bet Todd Bletcher horse. The other was a heavily bet Chad Brown horse. Yet it was Sanctifica that was able to survive that duel. She's not going to face that speed in the second race. She's a talented horse. I think Santifica can get the money in the sixth race on Sunday as we head back to Maggie and Richie. We want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We'll be back here tomorrow to do it all over again on MSG+.